Alright, good morning ladies and gentlemen. here at Beverly Vista Middle School. Um, so can I see, I just want to kind of see who's in our audience. So raise your hand if you're a BVMS parent. Awesome, great job. Okay, high school parent. Very cool. And an elementary parent. Wow, okay, we've got a great turnout. It seems kind of like an equal mix between all three levels. So thank you guys for being here. Um, we have just a few people I want to thank for helping to put this together. So, uh, BBMS PTA, uh, the PTA Council helped with funding the breakfast treats. BHP uh, is here as well, and then uh, the Boys and Girls Club also helped. We all are just coming together to create this event. Uh, and in a minute, I'm going to have our uh, panelists introduce themselves. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background of where this so every school site has a copy of the principal. Usually it's about once a month. And uh, here at BBMS we had our monthly copy with the principal and this topic came up. And parents shared their concern. And out of that copy with the principal, they shared that they wanted more information. They wanted an opportunity to learn about fentanyl and how we can support our kids and how we can be proactive in our community. And then from there, the parents were copying took it to the EMS PTA, um, and then the ball just got rolling. And it was really a great example of how all of our venues for communication and collaboration in the district work together. Coffee with the principal, shared concern, took it to PTA, PTA came and helped pull all of these amazing people here to represent. So uh, please utilize those opportunities to share your voice and concern. We're a team. And those are vital times to hear from you what your concerns are. And just for a if you were at that coffee with the principal that morning, could you please stand so that we could just recognize you for bringing that concern? across the city 
right now about this, and there is a lot of anxiety. I want to say that anxiety is not a great place from which to parent. Um, so I hope that you will, you know, take this information that we're all going to share with you this morning and give yourself a little time to process it and think about it. I think the tendency is for people to immediately dump it all back out onto their kids. So when your kids come home from school this afternoon, that's not the time necessarily. So, so wait until you're kind of in a calm place about it so you can have a really healthy um, conversation with your kids. So you are seeing all the same headlines I am. This was, you know, about a month ago at Bernstein High School in Hollywood. A 15-year-old girl was found um, dead in the, in the high school bathroom. She had taken what she thought was a Percocet for She got it from a dealer who was another 15-year-old uh, who went to another high school that shares the same campus with hers. Just more recently, there's a lot of people in my community, I live up in Palisades, knew um, this kid is a baseball player from El Camino um, Rail High School, and it was the same story. He took what he thought was a pill, not knowing that it had fentanyl in it. So what is fentanyl? There's two kinds of fentanyl I want you to know about. This is not the fentanyl that is making the headlines. This is pharmaceutical grade. Yes. You can't hear. Hello, hello. Oh, oh, that's much better. Okay, so there are two kinds of fentanyl you should know about. This is not the fentanyl that you're hearing about in the headlines. This is pharmaceutical grade fentanyl that's used in hospitals and medicine. Anesthesiologists use it during surgery. Uh, doctors may prescribe fentanyl for people with severe pain. Um, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're talking about illicitly produced and distributed fentanyl. This is not from the hood. I took this picture. This is from a street right off of Fairfax in the mid Wilshire area. This is affecting all, all communities. And so fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. It's extremely potent. It's about 50 times more potent than heroin. And it has increasingly found its way into street drugs. The heroin supply is completely tainted. It's in, it's in cocaine, it's in the, all the party club drugs, and it is increasingly in counterfeit pills, which is something we should definitely talk about. Why is it in there? It's in there because it is so potent and it is cheap. So it is for dealers, this is a good way for them to make more money. It can hook people easily. They're not trying to kill people because then they lose business, but that's kind of the cost of doing business for them. So this is from the DEA. This is a picture of a penny, and that little bit of white powder represents a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl. This is why everyone is, is terrified seeing, seeing all of these pictures. Um, so it is trafficked um, in the form of powders and sometimes in blocks like this, and it, like I said, increasing so this, this was, you know, recently in the headlines everywhere, rainbow fentanyl. This really made the, the parents of young kids very concerned, right? Because people say, oh, it looks like sweet tarts. They come in all these different colors. I do not believe that they are targeting young children. I saw there were a lot of elementary school parents here. But certainly if you have a teen or a young adult who might be trying something recreationally, maybe they're a first-time user, when it's colorful like this, it looks more familiar, right? So, so there's something to the fact that it's having these colors. But basically, they, oh, this was another thing that is, has created a lot of fear. Did you guys see this headline? So this was, um, they, they busted a woman in, in New York who was trafficking fentanyl, and she had it in um, a Lego box. And the reason I'm bringing this up, again, this comes back to this anxiety. I'm very grateful that the media is covering this fentanyl crisis because it's important for us to understand and talk about it. But it's creating a lot of fear. When this happened, this woman was not targeting children. She was finding an innocuous way to hide the drugs. But the headlines that I saw, there was one headline that said, um, you know, fentanyl found in Lego box. And the picture was like, a guy in a toy store holding a Lego box. So if you're a parent of a young kid and you see that, you're going to think, oh my gosh, not even the toys are safe for my kids. That is not, that is not what's going on here. Um, but they are making fake pills that look very real. So this is a picture of um, oxycodone, the authentic one and the fake one. I'm a physician. I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between these. Oxycodone is um, in the same class as Vicodin and Percocet. These are narcotics that people might take as a prescription, right, from a physician, 
Um, and so they're making these pills look really real. Uh, this is Xanax. That's, a, that's something that people might get as a prescription from their physician um, for anxiety. And sometimes teens will use Xanax. Or Adderall, that's another thing that's, you know, um, for people who have ADHD, they might get a prescription from a doctor for Adderall, but sometimes that type of medicine gets passed around along, passed around among teens. Um, and so same thing, they can look really real. I want to be clear that if you get a prescription from your physician and it's you get it filled at a regular pharmacy, that is not at risk. There's no fentanyl in that. This is these are fake pills that are out on the streets. And this is why this is terrifying, is because this is the most recent published data. It's from um, 2019, so probably the numbers are higher, but this is from the DEA. They do a drug bust, they get the, they get the drugs, and then they take them to a lab to analyze it, and this is what they're finding. Two out of every five of these fake counterfeit pills has a potentially lethal dose. So this is what this is what we need to communicate to our to our kids, to our middle schoolers or high schoolers, right? Who might be now going to parties and maybe someone offers them something. They need to know it's truly like Russian roulette. I mean, that's terrifying. It's like almost a 50-50 chance that what you're taking could potentially have a lethal dose. So the message for for them, for you know, for kids and teens is, you know, unless you're unless the pill is being prescribed for you by your physician, as in it's your name on the bottle and you're getting it filled at a legitimate pharmacy, you have to assume it's fake. And if it's fake, there's a 40% chance that it can kill you. That's the bottom line. So there's so much more to discuss. I'm going to turn it over to Nick and then we can talk more during the discussion. Oh, sorry. Biologically better able to handle the substance. 
At this point, though, when we're getting into middle schoolers, high schoolers, youth in general, their, their systems haven't formed yet. They are actually, you know, I, I urge parents to treat them as their poison, not as someone who is necessarily, uh, you know, just this drunk, made a, you know, made a mistake, had some fun, you know, someone to shame them. Uh, I always encourage parents, like, how would you like to be spoken to when you are ill, when you are sick, when you are scared, when you are vulnerable, when you don't know what is going to happen in this state of mind, when your body is not responding the way it usually is. So I, I like to encourage, again, this is something I call parenting currency. When the way you speak to a child, your child, or any child, when they are scared, when they are vulnerable, that goes such a long way for future conversations. This is someone who will remember how you treated them. This is someone who will remember how you spoke to them, how you made them feel when they were at their most nervous, their most scared, their most vulnerable. So these things go a long way for future conversation. This person, this child, hopefully will remember that, wow, I can go to mom if I'm not doing so well, if I got questions because of how you made them feel. A couple of these things Dr. Dr. Clark already addressed, but one of the other questions was, you know what, why are these drug dealers trying to kill us? Uh, kill our children, kill our teens, kill their customers. It doesn't make any sense. You're right, it doesn't make sense. Uh, that's also not their intent. Uh, I have a nice little formula I like to just lay out. So when you pair a highly addictive drug with an addictive user, that user needs more of that drug, thus you have a repeat customer, thus that is a business model. That's any business model. That is basic economics. Create the, uh, what is it? Create the need, create the demand, and get the customers coming back at a fair price, get them hooked, Round and round we go, that is the business model. So they're not trying to kill, they're trying to hook. Because when you hook someone with either the psychological addiction or the chemical addiction, you have a customer. You have a customer who keeps coming back and needs that product. I believe Dr. Polly already covered this one. Yeah, most of them are counterfeit. These are not being made in lab, sterile environments by physicians, not excuse me, physicians, by chemists. Uh, these are, you don't know where they're being made. So just because they look real, these machines are very easy to obtain, the, the pill presses and such, just because they look real authentic, you don't know. Uh, and I think, I don't know if we're going to have time for show and tell later, I did bring some fentanyl testing strips. Uh, that is something that we are passing out as part of our, uh, part, part of our program that we're doing. It's a very simple strip, we'll, we'll show it. Uh, yeah, we'll show it a little bit. There's QR code. We're going to share the PowerPoint. We're going to go all of that moment, but we will send out the presentation as well. And a shout out to Kata is here recording this presentation, so we will be able to post it for parents that weren't able to make it, or if you want to watch it, um, that it will be available to you as well. And also, I do forget to do a shout out to um, Rochelle Marcus, our board member that is here this morning. So thank you for joining us. of our district cabinet here, so Rebecca Starkins, uh, Tim Ellis, and Sam Tosi are here as well supporting this endeavor. So thank you guys for being here. I apologize for missing the show up earlier. Uh, okay, so we're going to jump into, we've got some questions that were submitted, and uh, because we're down the mic, So these are some of the questions that you guys submitted when you RSVP to attend. So I'm going to uh, shout them out to you guys. So I think the, this first question is going to be for Dolly and Nick, but if anyone wants to chime in, feel free. Um, so could fentanyl be found in store-bought candy? Should kids be allowed to trick or treat for Halloween or restrict it to toys and trinkets? What candy should be avoided? Okay, uh, Halloween, again, this is, I've heard a lot of anxiety from parents about Halloween. So, so there are important conversations to have around Halloween, just like there are always important conversations to have around Halloween. So when we're talking about, you know, middle and high schoolers or people who maybe are going to Halloween parties, then yes, absolutely, I think we need to be having conversations about, just like you should be having those conversations with your teens normally about alcohol, about weed, about other substances, nicotine, vaping, right? All of this is, is part 
part of this conversation and certainly about what you're learning about fentanyl. When we're talking about younger kids going out and trick-or-treating, I would let my young kid go out trick-or-treating. There's, I have not heard any evidence of fentanyl being in candy. Again, this is, this is something that dealers are doing to hook customers so that they can make money. How are they gonna make money by like sticking fentanyl in candy and, and giving it to trick-or-treaters? I just don't see that as an actual risk. But parents have always been concerned on Halloween. I remember my parents being worried when back in the 70s and 80s, right? So, so just be smart about it. If your kids are going trick-or-treating and they're young, right? Have them, you know, you're going to have them bring home the candy and you're going to look at the candy together. And if it looks like legitimate candy that you would get from a store that's packaged and everything looks normal about it, I think they can have that candy. Um, but certainly, I think there are conversations to be had about about fentanyl and about these fake pills and what they could potentially look like. I'm sure in as going back to uh, Halloween, so everybody likes to go to Halloween, which is house, awesome place, right? We're all going. I will be there. House of is going to be there. So this year we are going to change the rules just a tiny little bit, and so there's some information on the table. Uh, if there's panels, if you need to ask one, if you have some questions, give us a call, and we'll be more than happy to, to address those questions. Also, we have not seen any candy, any candy from a reputable uh, manufacturer that has been laced with, with fentanyl or with anything else at all. It is not an issue. We haven't seen it. Uh, our partners in the VA have not seen it. It's not something that's an issue. Now, to uh, re-emphasize the actual candy itself, right? If you have a little guy and he comes home, you should go through the candy. I went through my little kid's candy when they were little ones, right? Any loose candy, I would just get rid of. Right? If it's not in the wrapping, if it's not in an original wrapping, I would just get rid of it. Right? What we see the issue is with the older kids. Right? And it's not necessarily the trick or treating, it's the parties that they go to. They're going to these parties and they're experimenting and they're doing a whole bunch of other things that teenagers do. That's their job, they're teens. So we need to educate them as to what it is that they're doing and what pills they're taking or not taking, or they shouldn't be taking. So, as far as Halloween, I think we'll say, have the kids have fun, have the kids enjoy themselves. For the little ones, go through the candy the same way you always do. Great, thank you. Okay, so the next one So there's different answers to the specific question. So the dealers don't want to kill anybody. That's not what they want to do. They want to get hooked up into these drugs. So where the kids or anybody's finding them is through this illegal drug dealers. Right? So you're not finding those in your local dispensaries. You're not finding those with your local doctor. You're not finding those with your local physician. They will not distribute that. They're not in the pharmacies or with illegal dealers. So if we address the core issue of why is somebody taking illegal, illegal substance, if we prevent it from taking illegal substances, they are not going to be exposed to anything less with laced with fentanyl. Again, the dealers don't want to kill anybody, right? It's not a good business practice. But at the end of the day, you have no idea what's going into the spills. And neither do they, by the way. They're not being made in a factory where the MS and supervised by the FDA. That is not the case with those pills. So the easiest way to address the issue is to make sure that our children, and our adults, by the way, are not taking anything that is not prescribed to them. I think that was such an important point. That's important for our teens to understand is that the dealer that they're getting a drug from may not even know what's in there because that might not be the person who made the fake pill or produced whatever powder or substance, right? So, so that's a really important message because teens, sometimes teens are getting um, substances um, from dealers online, like they're connecting with Snapchat dealers. So that's a conversation to have. And part of that conversation is that those dealers don't have any interest in your health or your safety, right? They're just trying to make money. 
but also sometimes teens, whether it's a Snapchat dealer or a kid at their high school who's dealing or who knows what, they might feel like they have a relationship with that person and so they might be more trusting. And that's where it's really important for them to understand that that person may not even know what's in the drugs that they're selling. And I know she just quickly mentioned Snapchat, so I'm going to do a plug. Tomorrow night, we have another Parent University. It's our regularly scheduled monthly Parent University, the third Thursday of every month. We're doing a, tech, a mini tech conference for parents, and the sessions that we're offering um, include how to set up the parental controls on your child's phone. So tomorrow night at 6.30 in the key building, second floor, um, if you want some help with setting up parental controls on your phone. Okay, so the next question um, is uh, for anyone. So how does fentanyl affect the mind and the body? How do we identify signs of overdose from fentanyl and not from other drugs or alcohol? And what do you do if you see someone under the influence of drug substances? How do we deal with the fear of different possible reactions? I know Nick, you kind of addressed this in your presentation, but if you want to add to it or if anyone else wants Sure. So uh, once again, I like to I like to give tools whenever I I speak mostly with uh, with kids and teens, and so I'm going to use language that I would be using with them. So uh, who in here likes to be happy? We all like to be happy, right? So happiness can also be called euphoria. We feel euphoria. There is a part of our brain that's responsible for that sensation, right? The the, the reward center. So uh, there's many different neurotransmitters back there. But we'll talk about the one that's dopamine. So uh, I like to say when someone is very high on say fentanyl. Any opioids, meth, you know, some of the hard drugs, most of their supply of dopamine gets dumped out into their entire body, and that's why they feel so amazing, right? However, that supply of dopamine doesn't necessarily refill very fast. Sometimes it takes weeks, months, who knows? Now, that is, that's the example for adults. When it comes to youth, the body, the brain, they're still developing. That supply of dopamine is still learning how to resupply. It is still, hasn't even reached its full supply. And so when you start using drugs of this nature, of this, of, of this strength, at such a young age, you can actually disrupt the, the development of your ability to be happy. And this is, uh, again, this is, this is a very real thing. People who, uh, we'll go with adults, people who overuse, dopa, uh, excuse me, overuse that part of their brain, they are effectively less able to be happy because that part of their brain, the, the reward center, is not supplying as regularly as it used to be. And if not, it is permanently incapable of fully resupplying. So that hug, that should feel great, it's not going to feel so great anymore. Uh, I should be amazed that I am seeing this, you know, the birth of my child, but there's a chemical incapability now because of how hard that drug has hit my reward center. So this is the, this is a, so there is a psychological component to this, the, the danger, and of course, the biological component is just you're disrupting the development of a human. Uh, so I like to tell this to the kids, like, don't do it, you're poisoning the child. That's also biologically accurate. I just realized we didn't explain that uh, the reason why fentanyl kills people is because it affects your brain's, um, it affects your respiratory tract. You no longer, your brain doesn't think you need to breathe anymore, so you stop breathing, right? And then you're no longer circulating oxygen, eventually your, your heart, your other organs, Will, will die as well. So that's really important to understand, like why is it actually? <laughs> Nick, Nick addressed this, but just to reemphasize, like it, it's not your job as parents or your teenager's job to be diagnosing in that situation, right? If somebody is down and you think that substances might be on board. You are calling 911. That is number one, right? Whether you're using Narcan or not, if Narcan's being used, 911 has been called. That is that is the most important piece of it. But again, just as Nick said, like you will not do harm if you happen to have Narcan, which by the way, you can get Narcan if anyone wants to have it at home because you have teenagers coming in and out. You can get it without a prescription. You can also get a prescription for it, but um, pharmacies, um, in California and in most states that they have an open prescription to dispense Narcan um, to anyone who might want it. So and insurance does cover it. There are also some organizations like some of the 
the ones you have with resources and, and overdose and some others that will uh, send me Narcan for the for the price of shipping. We have questions, but I don't know. That was a, a perfect uh, segue to uh, what are our school sites, or who are school sites making a supply of Narcan, uh, and is the staff having trained on how to administer it, so if Daniel um, can speak to it. And then I'm wondering also if Dr. Um, Hank speaks of Detective Mendoza can speak to see like, what, what's the city doing as well. Sure. So you yes. So I'm personally training uh, everybody on how to use marketing and how to identify uh, if you're doing overdose. Uh, go. Right. So I'm personally doing the training for uh, all admin. I've already done the training for all admin and uh, the, uh, the district office um, on how to identify an opioid crisis and how to administer Narcan. Uh, on top of that. Uh, We've also placed Narcan in strategic places. So we have Narcan uh, at the district office. We have Narcan at all school sites. Uh, and an example too, we have Narcan at our athletic departments, just in case after school, football or soccer. Uh, so it's placed in a lot of places. Uh, each school site uh, has a, a volunteer a training for staff that is continuous through the year, and I'll be doing that training. So as far as the police department is concerned, each one of our officers has a kit in the back of the vehicle with not only Narcan, but also an AED device and a few other medical uh, uh, devices that we will be able to respond. And we've been very successful in actually administering doses of Narcan in the past. We have a very short response time, as you guys know. We call 911, we are going to be there in about two or three minutes tops. Right, so you are going to get somebody at your door very quickly, and we will administer the dose. Whether they need it or not is besides the point, because we're not a doctor. If it is, we are going to administer it. And uh, like I said, we've been very successful with that. Uh, we have a uh, good <laughs> supply of Narcan, and our officers are very good at actually uh, responding to these calls and uh, in addressing those issues with witness. Uh didn't want to skip one of the uh, one of the questions earlier on how to spot someone who actually is uh, under the influence of an opioid. So there is a differentiation. I've sat with a good amount of clients and also randomly on an airplane one time with someone who was doing some stuff next to me. And they so th this is someone. Sorry, <laughs> I've sat with a bunch of people. Uh, so you, it looks like someone who is drunk, but there is a there are some clear differences. So first of all, the the eyes, the pinpoint pupils. Uh, we are used to hearing, you know, dilated pupils for people on, you know, amphetamines on the uppers. This one will be the pinpoint, like really small pupils. So that's one right there. And then there's just the general, general posture. You know, there's a, there, there's just a slumping happening. You know, so a drunk person, there might be actually some energy there, right? Some euphoria going on, uh, but that's more visible euphoria. Now, uh, the person of the influence of an opioid that is going to be just kind of slumped over, looking like they're falling asleep, maybe going to fall over in their chair. Uh, that is probably one of the more clear differences. You're also going to get the clammy hands, uh, sometimes the, the pale gray skin happening as well. So those are some differentiators right there. But uh, I think just more general, you're going to get non-responsiveness. You know, someone who is very drunk, even you know, even your most alcoholic drinkers, they're still responsive. There's still a conversation happening, even although belligerent, right? Uh, with someone who is truly under the influence of uh, an opioid, there is just uh, it's a slur. There might even be some drooling going on. You know, there's just uh, again more, less responsiveness. I want to say. If you so. Thank you. Thank you for that. Also, I just want to one little point about that. So, if someone has alcohol poisoning, if they've consumed enough alcohol, um, high doses of alcohol can also suppress your respiratory drive. It's also a sedative effect, and so. So at highest doses, you might not be able to tell the difference again, which comes back to the point if that's not your job to tell the difference, your job is to get medical attention for those people. Uh, okay, so a lot of parents are probably wondering, how should I warn my kids? What should I do next? Uh, what words do I use? How do I have that difficult conversation with my students? Uh, 
go first. Okay. Well, so this, uh, this entire forum we're having here is a harm reduction type of approach to something that's going on. Now, that has been a bit of a controversial uh, way to talk about drugs uh, in many, many, many other areas uh, in the past and such. Harm reduction is really having a conversation with someone, knowing that a harm is happening or going to happen, but you are giving them the tools and the resources to reduce that harm, not to fully eliminate that. So when it comes to drugs, uh, the harm reduction example is someone who maybe is using meth doesn't want to quit drugs because maybe the come down is rough. It's like, okay, instead of doing meth, which is this harmful, how about switching to something less harmful in the meantime? Because you're not willing to say, no, I'm not going to not use at all, I'm not going to stop. Harm reduction is, again, it is giving someone the same exact discussion you would by having a sex talk. Okay? Just because you are educating them, giving them the tools, giving them very helpful information does not mean you are encouraging them. So the way I, I have been advising some of the parents to talk to my students, or excuse me, some of their kids about it, is just say, you know, I want you to be able to help out a friend. That's one way to go about it. Because some of the teens have felt very accused by the parents. Like, oh, I'm going to give you this because I think you're going to go out and use drugs. And, and that just shuts down the conversation. So one way kind of around that is like, look, I, I like to make parents and also the teens we work with my, my safety ambassadors. You know, you're going to go out to a party. You can be in a position to help somebody out by having a fentanyl testing strip on you or by having this information on you, having this resource with you. So it's a way to, you know, teens are sensitive, you know, and I, I, I understand that. So this is a, uh, just a kind of clever way around that. Like, okay, he's a friend wants to do it, you can help out that friend. That's also true. Also, I, th I think in general, the more we meet our kids with curiosity and empathy, the better. So so it could the conversation starter could be using this. Again, maybe not right after school, after you've thought about it, but hey, I went to this parent discussion on fentanyl. Have you heard about that? What have you heard about it? Right? That might be a starting point. Or maybe you're having a more general, broad conversation about, about other substances. And by the way, like statistically speaking, what you should be the most concerned about is alcohol, right? Alcohol, nicotine, and THC, cannabis products. Statistically speaking, those are the three substances that your kids are most likely to engage with. I just wanted to also make that clear, and I want to let you know that this generation of teenagers is actually using substances at much lower rates than past generations. So in many ways, they're very healthy. The difference is that now the stakes are so high with certain things like fentanyl. So I would, I would start there, just curiosity, what do you already know? What's going on when you go to parties? Like, are you seeing substances out there? Do people pass around pills? You know, like, start a conversation when we sit them down for this big lecture it's not usually received very well right and, and things shut down for younger kids you can start modeling um you know really important stuff around pills and fake pills by simply like the next time you get a prescription from a doctor or they get an antibiotic prescription they have an ear infection right you can pick it up from the pharmacy and say okay this is the medicine your doctor gave you, let's look and make sure it has your name on the bottle. Okay, yeah, it's got your name. Let's, we want to make sure we take it exactly as prescribed. If you read the bottle together, if you take it exactly as prescribed, right, you're modeling that this is part of taking a medicine you don't. And you can say, like, we wouldn't want to actually to accidentally take a medicine that was meant for somebody else. That could be really dangerous to your health, right? So you're just calmly, like, having these conversations. Uh, okay, so the last question is how is BHUSD educating students about fentanyl and substance abuse? So I'm going to speak about BDMS and I'm going to pass it off to Daniel to address the other school sites. So here at BDMS, um, we have it in the uh, plan. Uh, monthly, our admin meet with our students through PE classes. So it's small group, grade level. And our November, we do it the first of the month every month. So our November admin talk is going to also be with our counselors and they will be doing a presentation on this specific topic about drugs, substance abuse, giving them some tools on how to say no, how to respond to peers, how to interact when it's happening at a party. So that's the first Friday of November. And then the following week, 
Our counselors go in quarterly to talk to students about our four core values, and our next quarter's um, value is integrity. And so they're going to be able to talk about integrity in terms of making good decisions when it relates to this topic. And then um, November 17th, our parent university for November, we have another speaker coming. So if you want more information, in addition to what we provided today, we have Doug Rosen coming, who's an addiction specialist. He will be talking with the parents, and then um, we will have a fireside chat for kids, where actually um, Detective uh, or Officer Maitland's going to come, and um, maybe Officer Didion, and our counselors are going to have a fireside chat with our kids, where it's totally anonymous, it's safe. There's no like they can ask any question they want share anything they want to share with safe, appropriate adults and get accurate information. Um, and no, no names, nothing, it's just a safe place. Come and have a conversation with safe adults and your peers about a very serious topic. So that's November 17th. Fire's coming um, in my weekly update for that. So I'm going to pass it off to Daniel to answer for the rest. So, the district is sending out a couple of comprehensive educational pieces to staff and students uh, and also parents, uh, you know, about how to talk about something like this with your students, with your kids. Uh, I, things like today's panel, uh, county panels, uh, and I believe uh, Ali Norman here, she's over here in the corner. Uh, thankfully, we have her at the high school. She's really well involved with the kids with Norman A. Uh, she provides counselors for the students and other ways to have these. Uh, she also has these conversations with those people as well. Um, on top of that, she's very connected with, uh, I think it's at 10 o'clock in the morning, we have a news announcement, it's called the Norman Connection, uh, in which she also connects the students to the Norman Aid as well. Um, and I believe we are also doing uh, continuous training for the weeks with students and staff. Uh, Okay, I'll be really quick. So I'm Allie Norman Franks, the wellness counselor, and this month is our Substance Misuse Prevention Month. Timely, we were already having these programs ready and available for our students. Um, one of the big ones we have on the 27th and 28th, two mothers who lost their sons to fentanyl overdose um, are going to come in and talk to our freshmen and sophomores, any student who's in E. And they are going to be talking about how to recognize signs of overdose. They're going to talk about the fentanyl strip, the testing strips, as well as Narcan. Um, we have a podcast. Um, it's called Make Today Well Live Podcast. And we have one of our Maple counselors, Stephanie Rosenberg. She's been talking about drugs, alcohol, safety, how to protect yourself, how to protect your friends, how to party safely and celebrate life by doing things that you enjoy, like basketball and music and dance. Um, we also have a reality party coming up for parents. That will be this Sunday. It's, it is full, but if you're wanting to attend, you can go to the website and get put on the wait list. I know they're really trying hard to add anybody on the wait list. Um, and if the, the conversation about the Norman Connection, we are able to do that twice a month. And all of our students whose teachers show the Norman Connection, which they're all supposed to be showing, watched a video called Dead on Arrival. Six minute video that's so powerful. Um, there is a 20 minute video that you can get on, the, on our website at normandy.org that you can watch with your kids to give them even more of these conversations. Did I miss anything? Where is it going to be? Pardon? You said you watched the reality party. Um, the reality party is at a parent's home and for, it's for the high school. So if any of you have high school students, you can go to normandy.org in the parents' corner. Um, you'll see the, the links to get put on the website. Correct. That's only for the high school, but the, our Make Today Well Live podcast is a great one for you to watch and to show to your to your young young ones. I wanted to ask Detective Mendoza when we were talking about conversations to have with your kids. One of the biggest things I noticed is that teens are scared that they're going to get in trouble, or they're going to be a narc, and they're going to get their friends in trouble if they're worried that something is happening that's unsafe. Can you talk about the Good Samaritan Law? Sure. So.
basically, you can come in and have a conversation with us, regardless of what it is, and you're not going to be held accountable for anything that you may think you were responsible for. Um, and that's important for us because we do have these conversations with our children all the time. We do a lot of counseling. We spend a lot of time, and thank you, uh, Hallie, for, for your support and for your help. But we do spend a lot of time talking to our kids. And if we think we have information that is going to save somebody's life, we will lock on it. And uh, just anecdotally, uh, last week we received information about a child who was in, in, a, in a position where he could self harm. Uh, we took the information and we were able to save this child's life. Right? And it was all by cooperating and working and hand in hand with the partners here in the school district. So that was an extremely powerful way uh, to connect and, uh, and to make sure that our connections have been working and we provide the service to the, to, the, to the community. So they work. We're going to continue making every effort to continue to make them work and, uh, and take care of each other. All right, I'm going to get my steps in this morning because I'm going to keep running the microphone back and forth. So we have time for like three questions. So I'm going to. Uh, um, this question is for Detective Mendoza. Um, has there been any reports of fentanyl use in Beverly Hills this year? And um, how much of the actual threat is in our school community? So, to answer to that question, yes, we have had some issues. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been with the school age community. So, as far as our school age community, I feel very comfortable telling you that we are doing well. Uh, I would not be overly concerned about that. In the same breath, I would say be diligent, be vigilant, and, and have this conversation with each other. Sorry, I'm going to do the least amount of steps. I'll Thank try you to have a conversation um, today. But my big concern is, is that, yeah, we're talking about fentanyl, but then we're also talking about Xanax, and we're also talking about oxycontin, and then, you know, there's polytherapy, you know, poly substance abuse, but someone's still going to drop the ground regardless of the fentanyl. And, you know, but the, the real concern is, is that I'm trying to educate my kids on what opiates do to their body so they can make an educated decision when someone offers them, obviously, a substance, and then they can make an educated decision on whether to take it or not. Now, the concern is, is that if I'm offering them fentanyl strips now, whether it's for a friend or whether it's for themselves, and then I'm going to have to teach them how to use these fentanyl strips, then they're like, oh, well, it's safe to take now because there's no fentanyl. But polysubstance abuse is still an issue where they're still going to go into respiratory distress and die. So as a parent, I'm, I understand the need to give them the fentanyl. I understand the need to give them the Narcan. But at the same time, how am I not encouraging saying, okay, now it's safe to use because you've tested it. Excellent point. You make the most common point made by parents when we, when we, when we suggest this approach. Uh, this is more, obviously this is a parent by parent, family by family decision. Uh, there is no one way to approach this. This is a, in case you know, and or have a pretty strong suspicion that your child is going to attend something that has this around, uh, this is giving them the best possible resource. Now obviously you want to educate, educate, educate ahead of time. You know, hopefully they don't need any of this stuff. This is just in case that conversation stops. I'm sorry, in case that conversation is, well, I'm gonna go anyway. Well, no mom. You know, teens, they're experimental. Again, this is, I like to think of this just as the sex talk. You are, they are in an experimental stage of life. There are temptations of all kinds around. Uh, gotta arm them with something because the conversation, again, with the harm reduction approach, the conversation can't just stop when they say, well, I'm gonna do it anyway. Where do you go from there? So this is where that next level of conversation is for. This next step, if you will, is if there, if that is where the conversation goes to, you now, you as a parent now have other options other than just, now what do I do? You know, so this is not encouraging that. Again, it's just for that next step if the conversation goes there. Yeah, I agree. And also, I mean, there's so much more. We're like barely scratching the surface. So with things like fentanyl test strips, there's a lot of education. They have to really understand how that's used and that there could be false negatives. And so it is not a, like now it's safe to use. It's 
for someone who's going to use regardless, then at least they're testing it there. It has to be Narcan. There needs to be a sober person. Never try something alone, right? Let someone else know if you're using. These are very difficult, you know, things to think about, particularly if you're a parent who's never had any conversations with your kids. And if that's not necessarily the most appropriate conversation, that's not the starting place, right? And so there is so much other information for kids to know about mixing drugs with alcohol, right? Even caffeine with alcohol, how that might put you, there, there's so much more to discuss. Um, so I, I appreciate your point. These, these are complicated. I'm going to try to get into the way back. All right, over here. I apologize for this probably going to address, but is there any, um, can we sprinkle this alcohol or for weed? Because those are common things that teenagers experiment with. I'm going to repeat the question just so it's on the recording. So she asked, could it be sprinkled into alcohol or marijuana? The quick answer to that is yes, it can be sprinkled or mixed or in, in pretty much anything, but we have not seen it at all. We just haven't seen it. Is it possible for it to be mixed with something else? Of course it's possible, but we just haven't seen it. Right. It's more in the pills and the, you know, cocaine, heroin, the other supplies. So, but again, like, these are important conversations. If you have teens who are going to parties and they're drinking alcohol, you should be sending the message, if you're doing that, don't ever leave your drink unattended. Because maybe it's not fentanyl, but maybe it's a date rape drug, something else that's getting put in there, right? So, those are other important, you know, safer party messages. And Detective Mendoza and I were talking this morning before this started. Um, I was kind of like, so why? And I think, I'm not sure if it got said, but one of the reasons why the fentanyl is showing up in the pills is I think Nick mentioned it about it being highly addictive, but it's also really, really cheap. And so when they mix it with something else, you can spread that something else out a lot more then you add the fentanyl to it, and so it's cheaper, and so they're making more money off of it. Did I say it right? Yes. Okay, so that's part of why it's showing up in pills, and you wouldn't necessarily see it just sprinkled into something. It's about making those pills cheaper to produce. Okay, so I'll go from here, and then I'll come up here. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I'm a clinical psychologist, and I work with this population especially in our community, based in our people. I have to disagree that I do see a lot of it in our community. And it's not about fentanyl, it's drug abuse and use, and it's regular. It, it happens at the parties, peer pressure, it happens in the homes. There have been children during COVID that just sit at home together, three, four of them together, just smoking weed, getting whatever they can from the drug dealers and doing it together. And formed addictions left and right that the parents are unaware of. They don't know what's going on, the doctor doesn't know what's going on, unless they actually know, unless they're actually examining the child and talking to them. So I think education is very important, and if we can get that in all of our schools, the state no to drugs programs, really pushing it. Um, the preventative care with the test strips is lovely, but it, it doesn't stop doesn't stop anything from happening. Scaring the children stops it. Oh, that's good. That's scaring them. There you go. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think the idea is to allow them to know what physiological damage will occur from taking these substances. What will actually happen, like the brain damage or damage to your dopamine receptors, which, which is irreparable. Things like that, these kids need to know so that they can make an educated decision for themselves. The parties need to be monitored by the parents. So, I'm going to just respond real, real quickly to that. So, that's why we're doing these parent universities, but at the end of the day, what we really need as a community is not only for 
these parent universities, but also for the parents that are here to have those conversations with your friends and to encourage the parents to monitor parties, to do those things. So it really has to be a community effort in terms of what we're seeing. We, can, we only see so much at the schools and we can provide, like our counselors are going to be providing the lessons to our students. We're going to be doing the fireside chat. Norman Lee is doing the, the conversations with kiddos. But we need all parties, parents, everyone in the community to come alongside and help with this issue. So one last question. Okay, okay, we'll do two. I told you I went into faster. Doctor, no. Yes. Um, uh, did you talk about it? That how much, how much of the fentanyl in the pill is, and is that really what pill is going to affect the brain and kill? But I didn't hear that talking about it. Okay. So the question was whether really one pill um, can kill, and so unfortunately the answer. Yes, because again, these are not pharmaceutical medicines made in pharmaceutical labs. If you take a medicine that's prescribed, you know exactly how much is in there. These are fake pills that might have fentanyl in them. They might not have fentanyl in them. If the dealer sells someone five pills, maybe none of them have fentanyl. Maybe all of them, maybe one of them does, right? And even within that one pill, could split that pill in half, and one half might not have fentanyl in it, and the other half might. So, but, but that statistic I shared from the DEA is that that is what they, when they seize these drugs and they analyze them in the lab, they are finding that it's at least 40% of the fake pills that are out on the street in our country currently have a, a fatal dose of fentanyl in them. So, Literally one pill, and so why this matters is because this is not just something that's affecting drug addicts. This is people who might be using recreationally or first-time users, right? And so that's why we, we have to have those conversations. And yes, this is part of a much broader conversation, and, and I get the, the need to scare them. I personally don't believe in scare tactics with teens. I think they don't work. However, I do think they need an education, and I find that teenagers are very interested in learning the science behind it. They're interested in learning about their brains. They're interested in learning about how substances can affect that and how addiction happens and how to help one another. And I think if we can address it with them, which it sounds like your district is doing, that's going to, that really makes a difference. Okay, last question. Hi, thank you for being here. My question is about the why. Um, the kids are not reaching out for fentanyl, they're reaching out for Xanax, per Percocet, the others, um, which are really known to relax. Or So what's happening there, Are they? is it because they're feeling anxiety, and so then they're going for these pills? So, so we're talking about prevention. How do we address the root of the problem? You know, the fentanyl, I, I say it all the time, the, these things are symptoms. So how do we get to the core issue, which is why are they even wanting to pass these, you know, prescription drugs around to one another? What is it that they're trying to get to, to numb, to deal with, and then they get hit with the with the fentanyl as a side gift, you know? So how do we really prevent the root issue? The million dollar question right there because you're, you're right and so there are some teens who might be using just because they're experimenting or they're having an impulsive moment right this has been true of adolescents forever but we do have to acknowledge that we have a mental health crisis among among our adolescents and and that was the case before the pandemic but it has been exacerbated these kids really suffered during this time as did many of the adults who are you know, trying to support them. And so that's a huge question to answer, but that's where coming together as a community is so important. I think there's a lot for us to look at. Just basic mental health, make sure there's so much help out there. That's why you have the therapist right here in your community who works here. Like, thank goodness, right? We have all these caring adults, there's school counselors, 
Don't forget about your physician. That's a great resource to connect you if you feel like your child or a family member, a loved one might need additional support. But we could go on and on again. You know, make sure they're getting enough sleep. That's such a basic thing that totally affects their mental health, right? Make sure they're engaged in meaningful activities so they have other interesting things going on in their lives. There's so much academic pressure on these kids these days. College admissions creating all this anxiety. We have a lot of work to do as a society if we want to actually help our kids. But yes, some kids are using substances as a form of self-medication because they have untreated mental health diagnosis. I'm going to have um, Kristen Hartley Galbas come on up. She is actually our wellness counselor for our Bulldog Aid Center. Yeah, hi, I'm Ms. Hartley. I'm the wellness counselor here at Beverly Vista Middle School. Um, so, our kids are experiencing, I would say, like very, very elevated levels of stress and anxiety, more than anything that we've seen in a really long time. Uh, whether it is academic stress, whether, it, whether it's stress from too much social media or screen time, um, they are experiencing it. And yes, a lot of the substance use that we're seeing, whether it's vaping, nicotine use, marijuana use, um, or other sort of more harder substances, is coming, at least from sort of my experience in speaking with students who are experiencing these issues, it's coming from stress levels that they just cannot handle on their own. Um, so I will encourage you guys to seek out your insurance providers to see if they offer you any mental health support for your students. You can reach out to Allie if you have a high schooler. Um, they know that you can refer your student to seeing a Maple Center counselor online for the high school. You can refer online for the middle school as well. Um, elementary school, if you have a kiddo who you notice is already kind of experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety, even as an elementary kiddo, reach out to Ms. Fernando, reach out to Mr. Weddle. They can pair you with resources or they can work with you to support their student on campus. So we have so many resources, but yes, I, I'm going to agree. We do have a mental health crisis and I see the connection of substance use and stress and anxiety. Thank you. And just to piggyback off of that, so um, I believe this graphic just got sent out um, yesterday, but just to highlight, so in our district, we have six full-time school psychologists. Um, we have two full-time MFTs. We have nine secondary counselors, two elementary counselors. We have um, two full-time secondary mental health counselors. Um, we have a part-time social worker, and then we have our um, counseling interns through the Maple Center at um, our sites. So we have a lot of resources for our kiddos. Um, so please, please realize that uh, I know our kids are great about asking, but sometimes they just aren't. And so you can self-refer, you can reach out to the counselors and connect. Um, so I'm gonna plug in November 17th, is our next parent university on this topic where we'll have Doug Rosen, he's an addiction specialist, he can answer more questions, and it's also the fireside chat for kids um, that they can come, they don't need to sign up, they literally can just show up and we'll have our officers, our school resources officers who are amazing, amazing. And thank you, Rebecca, for clarifying. That fireside chat is just for BBMS so that the conversation stays middle school appropriate. Um, so that is November 17th. I'll get a flyer out for that. For the parent portion of it with Doug Rosen, any parent from any grade level can come to that portion of it. Um, BBMS PTA supports our parent universities, and they absolutely invite everyone to come to our. It's the third Thursday of every month. And I know um, Ms. Hartley talked about screen time and social media, so again, a plug for tomorrow night's Parent University on um, tech resources. So if you need help on how to set up those parental controls on your phone, please come tomorrow night for that resource. So okay, we are totally out of time. I thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you guys has already started, so if you guys could exit out here, over on this side of the auditorium, so we're not on campus, that would be lovely. Our security would appreciate that. Thank you, guys.